This conference will now be recorded. So today's topic is strategies to improve soil health with cover crops and vegetables. Now, most of you that know me uh, realize that I'm a third generation vegetable farmer. So it's something that I've been familiar with for all my life. My grandpa planted tomatoes in the 1950s. I'm still on that same farm today. Then my dad also had tomatoes. And then when I graduated from high school, I kind of expanded from tomatoes to sweet corn to uh, pumpkins. Uh, we have been growing squash for a local processor back in the days when Mrs. Smith Pie Company was in our area. Um, so I have a background of growing vegetables. There was a time where I was up to 40 acres of hand-picked sweet corn, and that's a lot for hand-picked sweet corn, I will have to say. Uh, at least that was what uh, we thought. I no longer do that. I still grow toma uh, tomatoes, but they're all in high tunnels, basically to protect them from weather uh, events and the quality and everything, because our tomatoes are all heirloom tomatoes. So I'm going to share a little bit about some of my experience. <clears throat> I've done some of the coal crops. I've done broccoli. I've done some cauliflower and, um, and a few things like that. So that's my personal experience. I'm going to be focusing on it today. <clears throat> I do realize that we have some people on here who are interested at garden scale, and probably some people are interested at uh, hundreds, if not thousands, of acres scale. So wide variety here. But what my focus today is really looking at the soil health aspects and then how to use cover crops in that context in, uh, in vegetables. So that's going to be what my focus is today. And I just thought I'd show you some of what we do with the squash and the pumpkins. Uh, you can just see uh, there how we're getting them ready to ship out. But in my area and in many areas, when you're not using cover crops, when you're using tillage, as we all know, the soil is subject to loss. And that's really what got me going, what got me into this back in the early 1980s when I started no-till for corn and soybeans. I remember that my neighbors said, well, Steve, when are you going to sell the plow? Because I was pretty committed to no-till. And I said, why? Well, I, I have to keep my plow because I still got to plow for my vegetables. And then it was the mid-90s when we found out that, well, looky here, we can actually no-till these squash and we can no-till these tomatoes. And so since 1995, I have not tilled any of my soil for anything, including the vegetables that I grow. So some of the reasons and some of the benefits here that cover crops have to offer, and I want to list this out right up front. This is a great picture here. On the left-hand side, you have a squash plant, a butternut squash in this case, that there's bare soil all around it. After a heavy rain event, the soil splashes up in the leaves. And if, if you don't understand what that means, it essentially means the potential of soil-borne diseases are very evident. If you look really closely to the leaf edges, you can already see those leaves have some disease coming in on them. Go over to the right side, and you see almost a perfect butternut squash plant, the way it looks when it comes out of the ground. For those of you who are not familiar with butternut squash, that's a familiar color on the leaf. So that's a really nice looking butternut squash there. So having the cover crop on the ground is advantageous from a physical barrier standpoint of not splashing up soil. And there again, we're also, we're looking at our soil health and that translates into plant health in this case. It's a very uh, dramatic, I guess you would say, uh, illustration of what can be done by using cover crops. Now, um, the next one is a video, it may be a little jerky for you, uh, but it all starts the fall before, or it all starts the season before, as far as setting ourselves up for a successful uh, cover cropping experience to try to accomplish what we want to with, with our cover crops and increasing our soil health and so forth. So, 
having a good cover crop established, getting it drilled in is preferred. So we so we are treating our cover crops like our cash crops. And people like to ask for a prescription of what the seeding rate should be. And I'm going to throw some numbers out. But before I share the prescriptions, uh, exact prescriptions, uh, those of you who have done this before know that most farmers, they start with a baseline and then they'll adapt from there. Like you may plant a bushel of cereal rye, for instance, and you may think, well, next year I'd like a little more or next year I'd like a little less. But the key is determining how to adjust your seeding rates based on several factors. And that's what I have listed up here on the screen. What, how do you look at the proper seeding rate? Well, one of the things is, is looking at the field fertility. Is it a highly fertile field? Is it one that has a history, it's just a good field? Maybe it had a history of manure application. Maybe it had a history of, uh, or just a background that's a good soil type. That can factor into the seeding rate uh, because a better field typically would require a lower seeding rate. And then, of course, the planting date. When are you planting? So, for instance, in my area, in southeastern Pennsylvania, if I'm planting in, uh, let's just say, the beginning of, of uh, September, <clears throat> there I might be able to lower my seeding rate because I have much more time for something to grow. And if I plant near the end of September or into October, if we're planting something like cereal rye, you want to start bumping up your seeding rate based on the date. And again, all these factors have to be in the context of what you're trying to accomplish. So if you have a nice mix and you're trying to grow a lot of biomass for weed suppression, then you want to go on the higher sides of the seeding rate. This is important to know on how to manage the cover crop. But I would also caution against going too high because if you have a highly fertile field, and a high seeding rate, your cover crop could lodge. It could go down on you and be flat with a rainstorm or wind or whatever. And then that can create issues or problems in planting. So these, this whole topic of seeding rates, I think sometimes good to review. And basically, you have to kind of dial it in for your farm. Uh, the other things to consider, and this is kind of basic stuff here with cover cropping, is your species mix options. The legume to grass ratio, a lot of times there's two main factors there. Uh, what are you trying to accomplish? If you have a situation where you want to create nitrogen, maybe want to favor the legumes. If it's like you're going to plant something, um, something else, you really want a lot of ground uh, mulch, like for pumpkins or squash, you want to make sure there's enough of cereal rye or triticale in there so that it stays on the soil all year long to protect the fruit from being splashed up with soil and also to keep the soil, to keep the fruit cleaner. So that's a situation where you want to make sure you have enough of uh, a grass type cover crop in there. The other thing is the longer you are in a cover cropping system or when the biological components of your soil starts to build and starts to mature, the Earthworms and all the uh, all the critters there will, will process your cover crop residues much faster. So as you evolve in this system, your your ratio of legumes to grass will shift more toward the grass or the higher carbon to nitrogen ratio uh, component. If you're not familiar with carbon to nitrogen ratio or C to N ratios, there's a webinar I did on that. You can go back and look it up and listen to that to familiarize yourself with that. So also in managing the cover crop and the, the mixed options is what are the fertility needs for that vegetable crop that you're growing? I kind of covered that already. Uh, and all these things factor in. And I'm just going to tell you that you have to start somewhere and kind of work from there to see what works in your farm. So here's some suggestions to get started. Again, pretty basic information, uh, but <clears throat> I'm just saying, like in the middle of a planting window, whenever it is, if we're looking at cereal rye, around 40 pounds with 15 pounds of hairy vetch is a really nice mix. 
Uh, if you get um, more serial rye than that, it may start going down on you, and you don't really want that to plant into it generally. However, if you're getting a little later in the season, and when it comes October, uh, you're reaching the end of the time when hairy vetch would be would make sense to mix in there. You're going to bump your cilia rye up, maybe up as high as 120 pounds per acre, if you want to have a nice mat of uh, of cilia rye for your pumpkins like the following year. And in that case, then you're going to have to add a little more nitrogen because you won't have as much uh, hairy vetch. So this whole thing of managing the seeding, managing seeding rates, timing is always a moving target. And uh, and then again, these other options to put in there, triticale can pretty much be swiped in and out or swapped in and out with cereal rye pound for pound. A crimson clover is a slightly smaller seed. So when you mix that in, you have to account for that. I'm suggesting there uh, 10 pounds of crimson clover with whatever you plant cereal rye or triticale. You could mix hairy vetch and crimson clover. You could cut those rates in half. Or, or whatever you want to do there. The other thing is sometimes people like to add oats when it's earlier in the season, just a little bit in this case, probably, like 10 pounds, throw a little radish in there, maybe a pound of oilseed rape or a half pound of oilseed rape. These are just other options out there. And then if you're really into this and really creative, there's 10 or 15 more other species that you could add if you're earlier on the year. So um, this is just to set us up for... Uh, for a good cover crop, establishing a good mix and a good cover crops for our vegetable rotation. So just going to briefly talk a little bit about weed control because in vegetables, this is definitely a, a characteristic of using cover crops that can be very advantageous. Again, I'm going to have to say that field history can give you an indicator of the degree of weed control you might get out of a cover crop. Is it a weedy field? Or is it a relatively weed-free field? That's going to impact dramatically. A big one is, are there perennial weeds like thistles or dock or whatever perennial weeds you deal with? Cover crops aren't necessarily going to suppress them or control them very much, if at all. So if you are wanting to shift to use cover crops for weed control, you're going to have to get rid of some of them perennial weeds uh, because they're, they're really tough to control with a cover crop. Something like thistles, if you cut it four times a year, uh, they'll, it'll help really put them back. And some people have the advantage of bringing hay into their system where it's naturally cut four times a year or more, and that'll help get rid of thistles for that instance. So the importance there for weed control, what you need to remember is that the biomass or the above ground growth and the consistency of the cover crop is critical to making any kind of weed control work. Because if you have varying uh, degrees of cover crop growth, you're gonna have varying degrees of weed control. And then you really kind of have to treat the field as it needs a total spray or whatever. And you're not really saving much out of that. So that's why drilling the cover crop in is so vitally important. Some of the control options here with uh, vegetables, uh, we're limited a little bit sometimes depending on what we do. Before we plant vegetables, either direct seeding or transplanting, we're going to show you some here coming up. Uh, we can go glyphosate or gramoxone. Um, and I would just have noted in there, you can use lower rates, half rates, or one quarter rates, sometimes in conjunction with rolling or roll crimping. Uh, I like to say, too, that I'm going to show you some pictures here coming up next of rolling cover crops and the weed control that you can achieve. But I like to say sometimes that the stars and the planets need to align for good weed control and rolling. Uh, number one, you have to understand that your cover crop has to be fully in flower if it's a legume, uh, or if it's a grass, it has to be beyond pollination just at the milk dough stage. For some, in some of our scenarios of planting, that's just too late to be able to do mechanically roll or mechanically crimp and terminate a cover crop. So we're gonna need a herbicide to take it out so that's just some of the um, I guess some of the examples there of how that is now here is an example uh, coming up here of where I was able to roll down a hairy vetch crimson clover and cereal rye mix with a roller crimper with zero herbicides applied and just look in there you can see there's some taller weeds in the background escape you look closely you can see there's some few weeds growing there but that's not bad actually uh, not bad at all. 
when it comes to zero herbicides. And and I'll just say too, it depends on the scale of your operation. I grow 80 acres of squash and pumpkins. So if you know if, if you have one acre, you can hand weed if you have to, but I can't afford to hand weed very much at the scale that I'm at. So so for larger commercial growers, using cover crops for weed control in the context of vegetables is an option, but it is always determined usually in the consistency of the cover crop. And um, so this is just a picture of a failure that I had. A lot of weeds came through. I was hoping to try this without any herbicides here. And it really uh, uh, didn't work that well. This was a very wet year, a very rainy year. And there's another thing here too, is I just used straight hairy vetch. This was actually done for a next door neighbor of mine who wanted me to try it on his land. I was renting the land, but he wanted me to try it without herbicides. I thought maybe I could do it, but it really should have had cereal rye in there. I think if we would have had cereal rye in this mix, we would have got much better weed control. But I just wanted to show you that sometimes uh, the, it, uh, the, the cover crop is unable to hold back all the weeds. Uh, this was a field that sort of had a history of weeds. Uh, it wasn't a what I would call a clean field. Uh, but I'm just going to open it up now. Anybody have any questions about rolling or uh, using cover crops or any of the any of the topic I've I've shared so far that uh, you want to have questions on or comments? Anybody have any questions? I got a comment. Yes. I, I was listening to a guy talk about his ranch and uh, he got tired of spraying thistles all the time with 2,4-D, yep. and so. What he did to get rid of thistles, and it's like if you have livestock, I guess it works, is uh, mm -hmm. he uh, went around the farm spraying his uh, thistles with molasses. And oh. the cows would go and eat the thistles. <laughs> he did that after a couple of years of doing that. His cows, he didn't have to, his cows would just go eat the thistles. Wow, that's the first I ever heard of that. Yeah, I <laughs> thought that was very interesting. Yeah, well, that that could that would be interesting to try that again to see how that would work. It's interesting to hear some of these little like kind of under the home remedy category there, but uh, for some people that may work. Yeah. Okay. Other other comments, other questions on what we've discussed so far. Any of you been doing any of this with vegetables? You want to comment on it at all? Not going to wait long. Feel free to pipe up. Okay, let's move on. Uh, I'll stop a little bit later on again. Uh, I have this picture here, and I have my title, Don't Let This Happen to You. And the reason I spend so much time on seeding rates and fertility and everything, we want to try to avoid this situation. And this is, doesn't matter if you're growing vegetables or whatever. When, uh, when in this case, the cover crop is blown down, uh, unfortunately, the rows here, or the way the field was set up, was to go left to right. So we have to cut across all of the uh, the designs here, uh, or we have to cut across all of the the stems, I should say, with a planter, regardless if you're transplanting vegetables or direct seeding or whatever. <clears throat> so the, the best way is not to let this happen. And that is by a correct seeding rate, seeding mix. And again, that's why I keep saying, you gotta start somewhere and then you tweak it for the next year and you just are really adamant about making this work is very, very important in, in my, uh, in my opinion here to make this work like that. So what you want is a nice standing cover crop that you're able to plant into and well managed, get good to seed to soil contact in what you do. Um, some of you have seen this picture before, but I have a very high priority of getting my cover crop rolled down for my vegetables before it's blown down. As you can see, there's a storm moving in. This is literally a thunderstorm uh, moving in on us. We're, we're driving as fast as we can. Because at this stage, if you look there, you can see it's it's actually uh, cereal rye and hairy vetch. You can see a little bit of the hairy vetch blooms, the purple blooms laid down there in the bottom of that picture. But at this stage, the vetch is really growing and the vetch offers no support at all. It actually can, can be a weight to the rye. So when you get rain and wind on that, it's very easy for that rye to blow down. So that's why I want my roller, in this case, to get it in the right direction so that when I plant, 
it's a lot easier to plant into because cutting across stems that are this mature is difficult. So this uh, next picture is where I rolled about two weeks before planting pumpkins and no herbicides were applied, but you can see the cereal rye was fairly terminated, fairly much terminated with the roller, but the hairy vetch kind of grew out from that. I think this is awesome because I probably picked up another 20 or so pounds of nitrogen from that vetch because it kept growing. My decision now could be I could go in and roll it again. And pretty much at that stage, you're going to take out the vetch with a good cover crop roller. Or I could plant, uh, which would, which just the planting of driving through with a tractor and a planter would probably take out 50% of that because vetch is very succulent. It does not stand up the traffic. That's why it's easy to kill, or to terminate with a roller. Or I could just add a little Ramoxone or some sort of burn down herbicide in there to, to finish it off. Uh, sometimes with pumpkins, I will do that. Uh, I will plant and then I will spray a, a residual herbicide and uh, mix a little Ramoxone with it just to burn off the rest of the sere. Now, obviously, if you're in vegetables, you know you got to be careful. You, you don't want to be ever using 2,4-D for most vegetables. If it's sweet corn, yes. but um, So just, just be aware of uh, some of the limitations on herbicides there. But this is a really nice thing about the roller in vegetables. We're, we're able to, those of us in vegetables, we have later planting windows. We can really let cover crops do their thing. And this is where it can really help benefit our soil's health. And that's really what we're talking about today. And that's why I think vegetable farmers have an opportunity to really make a serious uh, effort into getting their soil health, uh, shall I say, advanced or increased. Now, on the flip side, a lot of vegetable farmers have done a lot of tillage. And um, I know, Gail, and you're from out there in the Salinas Valley. There's, there's, I know there's quite a bit of tillage, and I, I, I understand all that, but Cover crops can help remediate some of those tillage passes that are used in some of the operations. So your vegetables kind of tend to have more tillage with them, but you also can tend to sometimes have more opportunities to use uh, cover crops. So now I want to move on to show you some of my experience of uh, this is actually no-till transplanting processing tomatoes. Um, and some of this has been done actually in large scale. Even in California, there's been some done. I've been there, I've seen it. I've been in the San Joaquin Valley. I've seen thousands of acres done in um, various ways, but uh, it is it is definitely a way to keep that soil health, uh, that you know, keep going in, in the soil health uh, paradigm, keep increasing the benefits of, uh, or utilize the benefits of cover crops as making soil health. Just a close up of the planter here. I just wanted to show you. This is a customized planter that I helped design. And uh, the goal here is to be able to plant our transplants into our rolled down cover crop. And this is why I keep stressing the importance of, if you're doing anything like this, to make sure the, the stems are laid down in such a way that it's easy to plant through. If you would be going perpendicular uh, to that, it'd be difficult to cut mature stems like that. I want to tell you a quick story. There's a reason I put the arrow in there so you can actually see the plant. Not too hard to see in this picture, but one of the early years when we were planting processing tomatoes, so we're in this field planting and my neighbor stopped in and he drives right across the rows that I just planted. He never saw them because we we're not really opening up the row. You couldn't even see the soil or anything. And I said, hey, wait. I said, you're running over my tomato plants. Of course, he was embarrassed, but it was just to make a point. I'll just say that it was, uh, you know, that we're, we're trying to keep the soil covered everywhere so weeds don't grow and, and so forth. So uh, that's just some of the nuances of growing in this fashion. This is one of my early pictures. This is back in the late 90s when I was growing fresh market tomatoes outside of uh, in the out, in out, outdoors. I grow all my tomatoes now in high tunnels to protect them from the elements. I've gone to heirloom tomatoes, which don't do well when we have rain. But just look at there. It's a primarily a hairy vetch cover crop that was rolled down. And at, when this picture was taken, 
I had not added any nutrients. No fertilizer was added. And those tomatoes, as you can see there, are doing pretty well. And uh, so it's just something that you, you can see how, uh, how, how, off, how, how the, the benefits that you can get with uh, like a hairy vetch crop there with the nitrogen it produced. The other thing I'll mention is there was no fungicides applied to that point. Now, if you're really astute and look on the left-hand side, you will see just a little bit of early blight coming in there, but not much. And we were able to, uh, once I learned how to do this, we were able to eliminate some of the fungicide applications because early blight is something that is actually uh, in the soil. And when it rains, it splashes up. Remember that picture I showed you at the beginning? Well, this is actually tangible evidence, and it's been proven time again that if we have the soil covered, we'll, we'll save in our diseases. The other thing we found out that was really cool is that we don't didn't have to worry about the Colorado potato beetle, which was a a very bad pest on uh, with our with our crop there. So this is um, some of the benefits that I found out found early on of no-till fresh market tomatoes. And here you can just see another field. This in this case here was primarily cereal rye that was rolled down. But note the heavy cover, and that's important, especially if you're going to uh, you know uh, have weed control and so forth. So uh, this has been some of my experience with uh, with tomatoes. Any questions? Um, anybody have any questions up to this point on transplanting or anything like that? Because I'm going to move on to some other crops. Any questions from anybody? Hey, Stan, yeah. I got a question. Yeah, go ahead. I was curious, uh, do you use pollinators around those fields to help reduce mm -hmm. the uh, pest pressure? Um, though... Well, I do not buy, um, I do not use uh, pollinators for, um, I do not bring them in like beehives and stuff like that. What I well, do is naturally, I was talking about, I was talking about naturally I, I plant, I plant pollinator uh, strips to attract the beneficial insects. And yes, I've been doing more of that. Yes, I have been doing more of that, Shane. That's what and, I was asking. Uh, yeah. And I really feel there's something to that. You know, the thing that, that really tipped the scales for me was someone once said it was at a meeting and they said along the woods edge, which I have plenty of woods uh, in my farm. So I have, I have, you know, areas that have woods around the, the along a woods edge or along a fence row or, or something like that. You do not make money on that. Let's just say 30 feet because of the shading and and so forth. So why lose money with a cash crop along the woods when you could plant a pollinator crop there and you can actually maybe impact the rest of your fields for good, for, for beneficial insects? So it's it's kind of like you're building a zoo. You're building a habitat for beneficial insects. And, you know, that's that really resonated with me. And since that, I have been planting a few acres worth of pollinator crops. Uh, I just rented a field, a farm, I should say, uh, two years ago now, and it was about five miles from my place. And I even, this past year, we had grown 23 acres of pumpkins there. We planted a 10-foot wide strip of pollinators kind of through the middle of that just to get attract pollinators there because it was uh, pumpkins and I wanted to bring in. And I think it worked pretty good because we didn't, have to spray for aphids or anything like that. So something seemed to be clicking in that regard. So, so yeah, I, I do feel that bringing pollinator crops in is 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 really worth it in the long term. So I think you were going to say something, Scott. I'm just trying to figure out how it would stop Colorado potato beetles. Mm. I forgot to um, follow up on that. The reason is we found out later, and I'll just back up a second. When we did, when I tested in 1995, I tested plowed uh, tomatoes where the, the ground was literally plowed and disc and harrowed and everything, you know, like we used to do it, versus no-till. And to the row, you could see there was no or hardly any Colorado potato beetles where we have residue on the ground like you're seeing in this picture. And what I found out later, even if you mulch around your tomatoes in the garden, you will see less Colorado potato beetles. So I'm told. 
And we pretty much eliminated them instantly when we did it this way. And that was really fun to see. I never expected that. But the, the what I've been told is they don't like the residue for whatever reason or the, 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 the debris, the cover crop a biomass that's dying on the soil surface. They don't do well with that. I can't explain it much more than that, Scott, other than well, actually, it was dramatic. They, yeah, because they actually, um, they fly, but actually most of the time, if they can, they'll just walk into a field. So that could right. be what stops them. Well, there's definitely something there because it it's, it's pretty much uh, happens in a lot huh. of places. Anybody anybody else want to comment on, on while we're in a topic on insects and so forth? And it relates to some of this stuff. Any other comments or questions? Hey, Steve, ours was on the alfalfa, but uh -huh. I keep pollinators around the outside of our alfalfa fields. Uh -huh. And we have not sprayed in two years. For, okay. And we sow pollinators and half-rate oaks through them in the spring. And okay. we haven't sprayed for weeds or pests in two years. Wow. So. Doesn't surprise me. You know, I hear these things, um, and I think there's, you know, it's part of the system. Uh, it's definitely the direction I'm headed to be more intentional and to try to figure out what species of plant should I really zone into. It's really wide open out there, but the concept I feel is good. And I plan to, um, mm -hmm. what, what I'm struggling with right now is do I plant a pollinator plot early in the spring that I kind of, would ideally it'd be nice to plant it once and then it kind of lasts throughout the year or do I plant it up to maybe two times or maybe even three times to keep species that are more suited for the different seasons. So I do know, I, I, of, uh, I think green cover seed actually has a pollinator mix that's designed to plant in the spring and pretty much last the whole year. So there's some companies out there that have some of this that, um, that maybe you can use, but, any more comments about uh, pollinators or, or anything? And then we'll move on. I had a question about your, um, when you're rolling these cover crops, are you also yeah. doing uh, herbicide on top of that or? Yeah, well, thanks for asking that, Allison. Um, we are, um, most of the time, I will use a little herbicide. Uh, I like to say a little herbicide goes a long way with rolling and crimping. There are times where I'm I'm in a field, we're rolling it, and I, you know, I can see like, wow, this is a really nice, solid, thick stand to cover. Looks good. We might be coming back, we might plant and we'll spray it. And I just shut the sprayer off on some areas of the fields. Um, mm -hmm. and 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 um and so that's that's kind of what I do. Uh, but I will tell you this that I probably spray 95% of it. I have a lot of acres. Well, it's a lot for me, 80 acres of squash and pumpkins and stuff. So I can't afford to spend a couple hundred dollars an acre to weed it uh, with hose and stuff. And I'll tell you, it adds up quick uh, if you're paying people to do it. And it's not anybody's favorite job either. So uh, I would say that uh, I've been able to essentially cut my herbicide rates less than half over overall, less than half with the roller. And that's pretty significant. So that's where I'm at. I know that some people are trying to, uh, you know, grow organically with no herbicides. And it certainly can be done. I have heard experiences of fantastic results. I've heard of some fantastic disasters. So uh, my, uh, my general take is a little herbicide goes a long way. The other th cool thing I'm kind of waiting for is we're starting to work on some of these, I'm going to say glyphosate replacements or other types of herbicides out there that may be a little more friendly to the soil. I'm all for that. I can't wait till it comes out. But I think in the context of rolling, that whatever it is that is out there, we can use it. We can use a lot less of it um, because I'm sure that if there's a replacement for glyphosate, it's going to be through the roof for a while. The price of it, and if you could, if you can do it with rolling, you may be able to cut the rate back to less than a quarter, or something like that. It's just a theory I have, but we'll see. Great. Yeah. Uh, any more comments? Steve, what are you using for your uh, species for pollinator strips? Well, <laughs> uh, you shouldn't have asked that. <laughs> up until right about now, I've been cleaning up seed that I've had around here 
uh, and, and I've just kind of using up some seed I had. But this year, I'm pretty much out of that. I'm going to be buying some mixes. Uh, see, I used to be in the seed business. I had a lot of stuff around here, but I'm using up a lot of that now. So I'll just tell you, Phasalium is a good one to get in early. It really does attract a lot of beneficials and so forth. There's different clovers out there. Um, and buckwheat over the summer month is, is always a good old standby. Even sun hemp that could be later on in the fall. Uh, I would say I would defer to some of the seed people out there uh, that that do it. I mean, the NRCS, of course, I guess you're from you're from Canada, but uh, NRCS actually pays for pollinator pots now. They require all these, uh, you know, complex things. Well, we have some people on from the NRCS. Maybe one of you, I'm not sure, are any of you, uh, Stephanie or Dan, Michael, any of you guys up to speed on the, on the, on, on some of the pollinator species, you guys, any of you guys familiar with any of them? Go ahead, Stephanie. Um, I know you're talking about some uh, different specific uh, program aspects of uh, right. uh, like CSP yeah. might have some yes. pollinator habitat mixes and yes. things like that. And I'm going to be really straightforward and say, I don't know exactly off the top of my head what some of those specific practices require. So yeah. that will be a state specific thing, but okay. uh, most, most states have developed um, mm -hmm. a list of cover crop species and then they yeah. identify the ones that are the most beneficial yeah. for pollinators. And yeah. like you said, Phasalia is usually mm -hmm. one of those number ones on the yep. mixes um, mm -hmm. and the clovers and the sun mm -hmm. hemp, like you said. And, mm -hmm. and I'm trying to think right now off the top of my head, I was going to try and pull something up that I had on my computer, but mm -hmm. I'm not going to try to scavenge for that right yeah. now. But yeah. um, every state has a list and sometimes you get even into a specific field office and they may be working with mm -hmm. um, local seed vendors or the, those seed vendors may be supplying uh, really specific mixes for areas within that state. So um, what I have found is that it's kind of across the board and two, mm -hmm. there's a lot of people that are very interested in this and trying different oh, yeah. things. I've seen, I've seen them. I've seen squash, you know, not just like in a milpa mm -hmm. mix, but some of these pollinator mixes mm -hmm. having different uh, ground cover squash plants in those mixes because of what they can attract. And then also the mm -hmm. benefit of having those large leaves covering mm -hmm. the soil at the same time. Mm -hmm. Well, you you brought up that. Uh, well, first of all, Stephanie, thank you for that great explanation. I'll just uh, make a comment. I did. Uh, I rarely participate in uh, any government program, but I do appreciate what the NRCS is doing in this. Uh, and I actually did sign up for CSP when I first came out, I don't know, it might've been 10 years ago with the pollinator mixes. And I, and I was I was told here in Pennsylvania what they wanted and the mix was very, very expensive. Now I got cost share for it. And honestly, it didn't grow that well uh, here on my farm. So uh, I was, I was, uh, it, it, what it did, though, it did its intended purpose. It got me introduced to pollinators. And now, like I told you before, I've been using just kind of seeds I've had in the shed, uh, using them up. And I've been usually planting them twice a year, one in the spring and one later in the summer. Uh, that's that's just what, what I did. I would say this is a topic in, in the vegetable community and also the, or anybody else that this is one of the hotter topics right now in soil health movement. The, the whole the use of that and I, I that we we actually had a uh, a talk about that way back in the 2017 uh, where we'll talk about beneficial insects and so forth uh, Keith Burns actually did that from green cover seed he was a guest speaker one time for that so if you go way back in the archives you can search for it and you guys can look at that but I I really need to do some of that I need to update that again so um, that's a, it's, it's a good discussion, but I got to tell you, we got to move on here because time is ticking. So I'm going to kind of blow blow through the rest of our, uh, our talk here a little bit, maybe quick, uh, just to, to get through it. One of the things is uh, changing changing vegetable species here is basically using plastic and watermelons and cantaloupes. And there's other things that are typically grown in plastic out, outside, like tomatoes and peppers, and especially in my area here. So one of the things that's occurring in our area is plastic laid in the fall. We never did that before, but the reason was because the soil was subject to erosion. But here's a, a kind of a, a little bit of a hybrid system. 
here of where we lay our plastic and then spread on about two bushels of cereal rye. And then we come back in the spring and plant it. Now, um, <clears throat> this video here will show you a little bit of how it can look uh, in the spring, in the early spring, came through the winter. And what's nice here is we really pretty much eliminated, pretty much eliminated chance of soil erosion. And we have a nice uh, uh, cover crop growing up there. It can act as a windbreak sometimes for freshly transplanted plants, whatever they are. And um, you can go in there and most of these cover crops are grasses and you can, you could spray select or I, I, well, select actually is the name of a brand you can spray, but a grass, uh, type herbicide, and you can easily do it. I am going to show you some other options in shielded sprayers, but here's that same field I just showed you in during a cantaloupe harvest. There was cover crops grown between there, and again, some of the same benefits that I talked about of the soil, and this is where soil health comes in, where those lopes are grown, the ones that aren't on the plastic are on the nice straw, and they keep a lot cleaner. So that's a big advantage. The other options to plant to lay your plastic in the spring and then immediately plant two bushels of spring oats. So you're swapping out cereal rye in the fall for spring oats doing it in the spring. And now you won't have quite the weed control when you do that. This is just a picture of it. You won't have the wind control because it's on behind usually, but it's just to show you uh, an option out there for plastic. Uh, I will tell you that in my area, we have a couple thousand acres of uh, small scale vegetable growers. This is, I believe it might be summer squash. Um, maybe it's, I'm not sure what this species is. I just took a picture of, uh, of someone local here, but there you can see how it was actually uh, oats that was uh, sprayed out and then the squash is growing out. Now here's what's really interesting is they've decided, this has been so successful that they're designing these little shielded sprayers with rollers. So based on the technology of rolling cover crops, and wanting to put it down, the rolling and spraying. So you have the roller there and you have the shields uh, the back there to keep any uh, spray drift off the plants. So uh, this is a little close up picture of the roller. There's different uh, styles being developed, but it's really interesting to see some of these equipment that's being designed and developed to meet the cover crop needs. Uh, this is where I believe watermelons were planted and this was actually rolled and sprayed. Now the with, with that there, um, the little machine I just showed you. Now the cover crop was fairly young, so the roller didn't really keep it down, but there you can just show the result. I gotta tell you, this isn't very pretty, uh, but I watched this field, it wasn't too far from my place, and you know what? It turned out fine. Uh, yes, didn't look like, you know, feels like we're typically seeing, but the little bit that was missed there really didn't cause much damage. So I guess I just wanted to suggest here and show you that there's different rollers and these things are, are being made now um, that just to, to see how that work has worked out. Now I want to go in a little bit of direct seeding here and wrapping up. Um, apologize for going a little faster here, but we had some great discussion uh, and I really appreciate that. The picture on the left is what we want. There's a nice little squash seed coming up. The picture on the right is a seed that is did not grow and the, the coulter did not cut. Why? Because the rye had blown down. And you can see it across there, and the coulter did not give a clean cut. The seed did not get to the soil. It didn't grow. These pictures were taken just a couple feet apart just to show you the difference from nothing to a beautiful seedling. So how do you do that? Well, again, let's go back to the machinery being designed. The arrow in the bottom is pointing the direction to travel. So it's like opposite of what you might think. This is close up of what we call a cover crop residue slicer. This is made by a local equipment company for the vegetable market and for no-till organic, uh, where that's tried to try not to disturb the row to keep everything in place so the weeds don't grow. So the direction of travel is basically from the right to left here. There's their are gauge wheels there on both sides of this straight bladed colder. So those gauge wheels are in an exact position where they're holding the cover crop in the ground so that if it is crosswise, it holds it in place and that blade will cut it more like a scissor, if you understand what I'm saying. 
and uh, it gives a better, cleaner slice. Now, I'm going to um, roll a video here, intentionally planted across Andros that were rolled down, but you can see how well that actually cut through that, and then we get out into the field where it's actually rolled right the way I want it. But I just want to show you that why this uh, was developed to be able to give a nice, clean cut. Um, so any questions about that? Uh, anyone have any questions about that? Anyone? Who, who makes that um, cover crop residue slicer? Okay, it is um, a local company here. It's called Pequay, P-E-Q-U-E-A, Pequay Planter. Thanks. Pequay Planter. I can put it in my... When I send an email out, I'll drop this here. When I send the email to the link, I'll, I'll, no, I'll make note of it. Um, it's a local Amish uh, outfit. They've really catered toward the small scale, a no-till cover crop being agriculture around here. Uh, they're not cheap. They're $500 a row. But I'll just tell you, they're a nice thing to have on, uh, especially if you have any kind of acreage at all. Uh, works really well. Hmm. Any other question on this? Okay, I'm just going to uh, kind of wind up here. Uh, for This is fall no-till broccoli, broccoli. And a lot of times we'll plant broccoli after early sweet corn. It's a nice kind of a, a double crop situation because sweet corn tends to be over earlier in the season, especially the earlier planted. So if you have at least four weeks between your sweet corn and when you need to plant broccoli in the fall, it's worth it to plant a cover crop. And in this scenario here, you might want to clean up any weeds that are around in your sweet corn, but then you plant your cover crop and then you can roll that down. Like you see my little recipe down there, 15 pounds of sun hemp, of 10 pounds of cow peas and five pounds of sorghum sedan. That's a nice little recipe for doing this. So you can roll it down and you may have to use a herbicide to, to finish it off, but you can no-till plant your uh you can no-till plant your broccoli in there if you have a transplanter. Uh, if you don't have four weeks between there, you can just go through the sweet corn and no-till plant uh, your, with your transplanter. And I know you're going to have to adjust your fertility, like I said before. If you do have that window of opportunity to get a cover crop planted, like a legume, that can account for maybe 30, 40, 50 pounds of nitrogen in a short time. Sun hemp and cowpeas put it on fast. So there can be a benefit there of, of actually some nitrogen production. Um, and this, just wanted to show you how this can look. Uh, this is a very small farmer, but uh, one row planter, uh, ro uh, sun hemp that was rolled down, no-till plant broccoli, cut its fertilizer in half. He is very pleased with it. So um, just again, to show you what can, what can happen. Um, and I guess this is just kind of what I said before here, right after sweet corn, uh, you can do it. I'm going to kind of shift gears and go back to the spring here a little bit and talk about sweet corn. Uh, I, I know we have some sweet corn growers on the webinar today. For earlier planted sweet corn, if you can possibly get like radishes planted in the fall before, that's really nice to plant early sweet corn into or radishes with oats. Something that winter kills, something that warms up the soil early. The nice thing about radishes is they have some nitrogen right there ready to go. and um, and the other thing is the soil is nice and mellow, warms up because of the, the, the kind of the little holes that some of the radishes leave. So for early planting, it's really ideal, radishes before early sweet corn. I know when I was uh, working with the radishes and growing sweet corn, th that just, this, the seeds would just come up immediately in spite of being early for me. So um, then later on, for later planted sweet corn, you can start uh, setting yourself up in the fall with more like things like hairy vetch. You can go with straight hairy vetch if you really want to maximize nitrogen. I would encourage mixes with a little bit of grass, but maximize your legumes because you want them to build up nitrogen so your uh, so your sweet corn can take advantage of it. So I'm suggesting some seeding rates there around 20 pounds of hairy vetch. Why not throw a couple pounds of radishes in? A little bit of spring oats to give some protection for the the vetch over winter. Uh, this is kind of the classic uh, recipe, I will say, in front of something like that you're growing corn. 
So then you'd be able to probably dramatically reduce your nitrogen if you're planted later planted corn. It's going to vary areas of the country. But I just want to show you this picture here. This is uh, probably, ooh, I'm going to guess 12 years ago, more or less. This is corn. It was um, This picture was, was taken in the beginning of September, planted in the middle of June. Full coverage of hairy vetch, zero nitrogen applied. Zero nitrogen applied. And that's really fun when you can do this uh, because it saves money and it works. Weed control is awesome and it really works good. So just a summary here. Uh, one of the some of the challenges with growing cover crops in the context of trying to increase your soil health, just knowing how to manage them. That's why I spend so much time up. Learning how to manage these cover crops is important to set yourself up for success. And then the equipment and the setup and so forth um, uh, to, to make this successful. These are some of the biggest challenges I see. And then understanding the fertility needs of your, of your cash crop, your subsequent cash crop. That's where you can save yourself some money if you're able to do the top two things first. And that's why I put them in that order. Of course, the benefits, cleaner fruit and less soil-borne diseases, which I highlighted, uh, maybe not as much in corn, but um, in, in a lot of these other crops, it does make a difference. A lot of times, better harvesting conditions, which can be really sometimes a dramatic difference. Sometimes uh, it, it uh, will really be huge. And I put on there some weed control. Um, I pretty much um, uh, believe that um, it can happen if you're able to if things are able to, uh, you know, fall together right. So just uh, wrapping up here, um, I don't have next week's uh, webinar assigned yet, but I have a couple more exciting ones coming up, and I wanted to let you all know about them, and I'm starting to advertise them. I'm going to be interviewing some more other experts, I would say, out in the cover crop arena. And on March the uh, – Oh, I get the wrong date there. So I think it's March the the 12th. I'm sorry. I, I, I'm going to have to correct that. I'm going to have Ryan Stockwell, who's a I consider probably the foremost expert in understanding cover crops and crop insurance. So that's, the, that's in March. And I'm really excited to be able to have an interview with uh, Rowan Atwood, who is a director of sustainability for Wrangler Jeans. And <clears throat> those of you who have heard me talk, and I've mentioned it occasionally here, how Wrangler Jeans is really making a, an honest effort to help their cotton growers to understand the benefits of soil health and uh, using cover crops and reduced tillage and so forth. So we're actually going to have them here. You guys can actually talk to them. You can ask them questions. I'm super excited about that. Um, so that's that's something we all can look forward to here in the next, uh, the next two months or so. And I'll have more people coming in here that I think are going to be really good to help give us a broader perspective on cover crops. So I know our time is really short. I only have a couple minutes left, but is uh, we've had a lot of time for discussion of questions throughout, but is there any like final question or uh, clarification or, or comment anyone would like to make about anything that we talked about today or any other cover crop question you might have? I, I have one question. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, um, I work with a conservation district and I was talking with a grower yesterday who um, noticed that she, she has several different fields of a rye vetch mix. And um, she noted that the, the stands that she planted uh, a little earlier, maybe a little bit before the ideal planting date, um, just kind of died off and and smothered and I remember listening to a podcast you did a while back about yep. planting and if things get too big yep. they, they smother out. Yep. This was trying to understand that a little bit more, what happens there. Sure, that's, that's an excellent question. Basically you mentioned hairy vetch. If hairy vetch grows over twelve inches, I'm just giving you a general a general uh, measurement here. We could say twelve to eighteen inches, but let's just say twelve inches it will winter kill very, uh, very easily. And part of it is it just, it's just the nature of the plant. So uh, my comment on that is that's not necessarily a bad thing unless you were planning on letting it grow out in the spring 
and rolling it and terminating it that way because a hairy vetch that's grown 12 to 18 inches will probably have maybe fixed up to 50 pounds of nitrogen. So if it's nitrogen you're going after and you're going to plant early in the spring, not a big deal. However, if you're waiting, if that crop was intended for something like pumpkins or squash that you don't intend to plant till June the 1st, then you have to realize you can't plant it that early or you risk winter kill. Okay. So there's a physiological thing that happens there. Uh, once it grows to a certain point, I've even seen, even cereal rye, I've seen annual ryegrass planted in July that was a foot and a half tall and it winter mm -hmm. killed because it basically smothered itself out. Um, and so the uh, same thing can happen with Crimson Clover. If it grows uh, a lot in the fall, it can winter kill. And there's been some very disappointed people that did not, was not aware of this. Uh, one, one gentleman bought a cover crop roller, a $20,000 cover crop roller, planted 100 acres of hairy vetch, planted it in the second week of August, this would have been in Ohio, mm -hmm. and it all winter killed, and he was worse than disappointed. Yeah. Um, now, <clears throat> I told him that he still has some nitrogen there, but that is just the way it works with uh, with a cover crop like hairy vetch. Great. So, does that answer your question, Stephanie? Yeah, thanks. Yeah, no, well, you can relay that back. Mm -hmm. Another question or two from anybody? Anything at all? Hey, Steve, this Any is Stephanie. Yeah. Go ahead. I, I just I wanted to make an additional comment. We were talking about the the pollinator strips or the insectary strips yeah. or some of those things. Mm -hmm. And and if people are you know interested in in reading more, uh, one of the books that I look at a lot or books. Uh, plural, mm -hmm. um, Xerces Society has some really great yep. books talking about farming with native beneficial insects or attracting native pollinators. Um, and mm -hmm. some a big part of their discussion is about the perennial strips, which if I remember right. correctly, you started with and then moved to the, like the annual cover crops. But they yeah. do include a couple different chapters on using annuals in the insectuary strips mm -hmm. and different things like that or, or how to use cover crops in those roles. So sure. um, they get some really nice and they those books have such beautiful pictures um, that they uh -huh. are really nice to look at and really get an idea of, of visualizing this on your farm. Um, so I do refer well, to those books know, a lot. That's good. That's good to know. And I will just say you mentioned the beauty. Beauty doesn't pay the bills, but it gives good rapport for the community. Uh, if you're, <laughs> if you have social benefit. Strips that, oh, absolutely. It makes people talk. And it's a good thing. And then you can tell your story. Why are you yeah. having those flowers out in your field? Then you can tell your story. And agriculture is usually in a negative context. I mean, I've, had, I've seen people actually do newspaper articles you know, about about a local farmer using pollinator strips. And that's really, really good. Um, it's just one of those things that it's good, positive publicity. Uh, again, like I said, it doesn't pay the bills, but it does it does bring, it is merited. I will say there's value to there in something. So um, appreciate you bringing that up. Well, okay, we're up here. Uh, time's up today. Um, thanks for all your participation. Appreciate it very much. So stay curious. Keep learning. We'll see you next week. Thank you.